This is going to be the video on section 3.4, which covers contingency tables. So a contingency, ta a contingency table provides a way of showing our data, portraying our data that can make it a little bit easier to calculate probabilities. The table helps us in determining conditional probabilities pretty easily, um, and the table displays sample values in relation to two different variables that may be dependent or contingent on one another. So here is an example of a contingency table. Um, it, this is fictional data, but it's a study of speeding violations and drivers who use cell phones. So we have uses a cell phone while driving. We have people who use a cell phone and have a speeding violation using a cell phone with no speeding violation. And you add up these, the rows to get the total across in the row. Same thing going down, so people with speeding violations and using a cell phone, 25, speeding violation, but no cell phone use, 45, those add up going down. And so as we'll see on the next slide, or actually this one, so if you add across, so 70 plus 685, you get 755, that's the total number of people in the sample. And then each row adds across, and each column adds down to get those totals. So with the same table data, we're going to figure out a couple of probabilities. We're going to find the probability that a driver is a cell phone user, the probability a driver had no violation in the last year, the probability a driver had no violation in the last year and was a cell phone user, um, the probability that the driver is a cell phone user or had no violation in the last year, the probability that the driver is a cell phone user given the driver had a violation in the last year. And lastly, we're going to find the probability that the driver had no violation in the last year given the driver was not a cell phone user. So finding the ands and the ors and the conditionals um, are pretty a little more straightforward when you have a contingency table and all of the data laid out in front of you. So if we look at the driver is a cell phone user, so uses a cell phone while driving is this whole row. It's going to be 25 plus 280 or 305 divided by the full um, number of people in the sample. So 305 divided by 755 is 0.4. So that's the probability that the driver is a cell phone user. The probability that the driver had no violation in the last year. So we're going to go down this column. 280 plus 405 is the 685 out of our full sample, 755. So it's 0.91. And now we're going to look at drivers who had no violations in the last year and was a cell phone user. So uses the cell phone is this row, no violation in the last year. That's 280 drivers out of our 755. And that gives us cover up some of this information, unfortunately, um, 0.37. Now, the driver is a cell phone user or the driver had no violation in the last year. So um, these are the cell phone users, okay, 305, no violation in the last year, 685. But this is where we want to be careful. So this is the addition formula. We want to take out this 280. So we could do 305 plus 685, but we would have to subtract off the overlap for those two categories. Or we could take 25 plus 280 plus 405 and then divide by our total. So there's a couple of different ways to do the um, conditionals, sorry, the ors um, when you have a contingency table. So again, remember it's probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the and. So um, in this case, what I did is I took the 305 and then I just added on the 405 so that I didn't double count the 280. I didn't use this total here. Divide by my full sample of 755 and I get 0 0.94. So now the conditional. The driver is a cell phone user given the driver had a violation in the last year. So we can use the conditional formula or we can look at our contingency table and reduce our sample space. So given the driver had a violation in the last year, so these are all the people who had a violation in the last year, there were 70 of them. So who, how many of out of that group was a cell phone user? 
25. So we can write 25 over 70 and get 0 0.36. If you use the formula, you're going to get the same answer. It's just one way to do it with a contingency table. What's the probability a driver had no violation last year, given the driver was not a cell phone user? So again, we're going to reduce the sample space. Not a cell phone user is 450. And no violation, 405 out of that group. So 405 divided by 450 is 0 0.90. So here's another contingency table, one more example. This is the number of athletes who stretch before exercising and how many had injuries within the past year. So again, stretches goes across, does not stretch goes across, injury goes down, no injury goes down. So we're gonna look at the probabilities that an athlete stretches before exercising, the probability an athlete stretches before exercising, exercising given they had no injury in the last year. Oh, those are just two. <laughs> so um, an athlete stretches before exercising. So uh, 55 plus 295, 350 out of our 800 is 0.4375. And what is the probability that an athlete stretches before exercising given they had no injury in the last year? So we're going to look down this column for the no injury folks. So our new denominator or our new sample space is 514. And those who stretch before exercising is 295 in my reduced sample space. So 295 over 514 is 0 0.5739. So here is um, try it 3.23. This table shows um, the table shows relates the weights and heights of a group of individuals participating in an observational study. So we have heights, tall, medium, short, weights, obese, normal, underweight. And this table is missing some of the um, entries. So what we're going to do is we're going to fill in the table. Then we're going to find the probability that a participant was tall, the probability a participant was normal height and, sorry, normal weight and tall the probability that somebody was tall given that they were of normal weight, the probability that somebody was of normal weight given they were tall, the probability that somebody was tall and underweight, and then are the events normal and tall independent? So here on the slide, um, the table's filled in. Here are the other um, questions we're going to answer. And then what I did for this one is I just showed you how I got some of these numbers. So for the first number, and when you're filling in your contingency table, this is the way that I wrote it down. You can go in a different order as long as you, you know, stay organized um, and, you know, don't mix numbers up or whatever. But to get this 12, I took 50, I subtracted 20, I subtracted 18 to get the 12. Then to get this 104, I added 28 plus 51 plus 25 to get the 104. That's this piece here. Then I did 51 minus 9 minus 14 to get 28. And then I did 18 plus 28 plus 14 to get the 60. And then to get this 205, I ran out of room, but you do 60 plus 99 plus 46 to get the 205. So you fill in the pieces you can. Sometimes you need to get you know, this 104 maybe before you can get the 205 or the 60 before you can calculate it. So you just go step by step to fill in your table. So now to find the probability that um, an individual participating in the study was tall, we're going to look down here to our total tall, 50, and we're going to divide by our total sample, 205. That would get 0 0.2439. Normal and tall, it's going to be this one over here, this overlap, 20 out of 205, or 0 0.0976. The probability that a participant was tall given that they were of normal weight. So we're going to look at the normal weight is our new denominator, 99. And of those 99, 20 were tall. So 20 over 99 gives us 0 0.2020. The probability that a uh, participant was normal height, normal weight, I'm sorry, I did that again, normal weight given that they were tall. So we're going to take our tall column 
and we're going to take that same 20, but this time we're going to divide by 50. So 20 over 50 is 0 0.4. And the probability that a participant was tall and underweight is going to be 12, but now we're back to our original um, sample size of 205. So we get 0 0.0585. And then the question, are the events normal and tall independent? So um, there were a couple of ways that we would show that if they were independent, they had to pass three tests. So if they fail one, then um, we know it's not independent. So if we look at the conditional, and in this case, I looked at the conditional tall given normal. So tall given normal was 0 0.2020. And if these events were independent, this number would be equal to the probability that a participant was tall, which is 0.2439. They are not equal, so automatically those two events are not independent. If that was true, if they were equal, then we would have to check the other ones. If all three conditions were true, then we could say that they were independent. But to prove something isn't, you just have to show one time it fails. So, that is the end of the video for section 3.4 on contingency tables.